you are here. <laughs> it's really small if you think about it, right? It's not in the center of anything. It's not in the center of Europe or in the center of Asia. It's oh, way off on the side, way up north. Uh, but it is worth trying to figure out why it has been uh, so ge geopolitically important. As I'm sure Mary told you earlier, uh, Korea is interesting geographically because there's, there's a lot of things we say the most, the biggest, et cetera, in the world. But this is actually true. It's the only place in the world where the interests of the four major superpowers literally touch each other. And what I mean by that is, like, if you go to India or Iran or Iraq, USA is 10,000 miles away, Russia is 10,000, you know. Here, whoops, Korea shares land borders with Russia and China. Its closest relation uh, to Japan is 50 miles by ferry. And of course, as many of you know, the United States had at one time 100,000 troops and nuclear weapons on the peninsula. And now we have 30,000 troops. So the four biggest economies, the four biggest countries in the world are literally nose to nose on the Korean peninsula. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys have heard this before yet, but uh, you know how Italy looks like a boot? What does Korea look like? If you sort of squint, what does it look like? Raise your hand. Don't shout it out. Uh, in the back. Yeah. A rabbit. Wow, you guys are good. Did you hear this before? You already heard this. No, did you? OK, where, where, where is it, right? Korea looks like a bunny, right? Here's the ears. Here's the little nose. Here's some paws, and here's some paws, right? Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this is sort of traditionally, when I was growing up, this is what we said. But what, it, what, it's, what, it's, come, what it's come to be known sort of in, in international relations is like being a, looking like a bunny, not that macho, right? <laughs> not manly enough. So Koreans will now tell you uh, that it looks like a tiger. <laughs> However, and this may not be politically correct, but I submit to you that is not what you would think of. You know, I mean, you really have to squeeze the tiger to get it in there, right? I mean, I think it looks more like a bunny, frankly. But uh, I will admit a tiger is more macho. So um, anyway, that's, that's what Korea looks like. Now, how big is Korea? In, in general, as, as, as we know, we tend to think of China and Japan as huge. And Korea as really small. So one thing that we did, uh, you can do, is you can take population and sort of landmass, the size in 1,000 square kilometers. And you put a bunch of Asian countries on there. And it looks sort of what you expect. Japan's big, 130 million people. Thailand, Philippines, South Korea, uh, 45, 50 million people. Singapore is tiny, of course. It's a little city state, about 4 million people. So yeah, right? There's some really big countries. There's some small countries. But in a way, that doesn't necessarily tell us that much about it. One of the interesting things we can do is what if we picked up Korea, if we picked it up and we put it in Europe? How big would it be? Because in general, we tend to think of European countries as big, and you know, a lot of these Asian countries as small. So we did the same thing, population and land mass. What's interesting about this chart? Just go ahead and look at it for a minute. I mean, the first thing I would say is Japan is huge, right? With 130 million people, Japan is almost twice the population of Italy, France, UK. Japan is a monst huge country if we put it in Europe. And a unified Korea would be roughly the same size as all the European countries, 75, 80 million people, and a land mass roughly the same. It's not like UK, Germany, and Italy are over here, and Korea is down there. I mean, Korea is a big country if you put it in Europe. It's actually not that small, because we're used to thinking of Germany and France and whatever as being big, right? The problem for Korea, and frankly for Japan, is that this is a false map, because this is really what East Asia looks like. <laughs> That's Japan down there. That's Thailand. Korea is the 48, right? South Korea. China is huge. China is a continent-sized country. So of course, compared to China, everybody's small. It's the same way as the United States, right? We are a continent-sized country. Right? So European countries would all be clustered around there, you know, and the U.S. is here. But it's just to give you a sense of the scale, right? For most countries that aren't continent-sized, Korea is actually pretty normal-sized. It's not that small. 
Now, why also do we care? This is a chart, and, and I don't have too many charts, but I think this is very interesting. One way we compare is economic development. We all know that Korea, how many of you have a Samsung or an LG phone, TV, et cetera, Hyundai car, right? Korea's had an economic miracle in many ways. It's one of the things when I teach my undergrads or my MBA class that we, f we spend time on. How did they grow so fast? But this chart is particularly vivid because it's not just are we richer than we were before. Because every country is basically richer than they were before. No matter how poor they are, you know, cell phones didn't exist. And now you've got people in the poorest of countries who can actually buy a cell phone, right? So they're better off than they were. But often we want to measure, are you catching up to the richest countries, or in, in this case, the United States? So what this does here is puts uh, uh, economic wealth per person income, GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita, or wealth per person, as a percentage of American wealth per person. OK, so you guys got that, right? If you go back to 1950, uh, the red is Mexico and the blue is Brazil. Uh, 25, 15% is rich. So every Mexican was about 25% as rich as every American per person. You watch over uh, a generation, by the 1980s, Mexico had risen to 35%. Uh, they were beginning to catch up. However, that was short-lived. And so by 2005, 2004, Mexico is basically per person as rich as it was 50 years ago. So yeah, Mexicans today are richer than they were yesterday. Brazilians were at 15%, now they're at 20%, right? But they're not really closing the gap in terms of wealth compared to the United States. The United States is getting richer just as they're getting richer. And sadly, this is the case for most countries around the world outside of Europe. Africa, Latin America, Middle East, many South Asian countries. So why are Korea, Taiwan, these kind of countries so interesting? They started out, green is Taiwan, yellow is Korea. They started out at 10% as rich, one-tenth as rich per person as America in 1950. But rather than a sort of up and down thing, it's almost a direct line upwards. So that by 2004, they're over 50% as rich as the United States. And they've continued to close the gap. These numbers just haven't been updated. So these are countries that have truly closed the gap compared to the United States in terms of economic development. And you can see that if you ever go to Seoul, if you, anyone goes to Korea, Japan, Taiwan, these countries in many ways are more sophisticated, <laughs> more technologically intense than um, uh, American countries. Yes? Did you define Korea? No, this is just South Korea. We'll talk, we're going to talk about North Korea later, because North Korea has not closed the gap. <laughs> because this is truly amazing, what the, South, uh, what the East Asian countries have done, particularly South Korea and Taiwan. How did they do this? How did they catch up and nobody else caught up? I'm not going to answer it here. We're going to move onwards. But I'd be happy to talk about it as, as, as we go, right? So just in the interest of time, so, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to try and finish with enough time that we can talk about whatever you guys want. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, this is just some reasons why we think Korea is interesting, why we might want to study it. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk now about uh, uh, pre-modern Korean history a little bit. And I'm going to leave you with, uh, I want to start with a question, which I don't expect you to be able to answer. Uh, but how many times did Japan and China invade Korea? Does anybody know? I mean, I just heard Mary mentioning it before, so I think it gave away a little bit. But does, I don't expect you to. I didn't know before I started doing this research. Does it, you don't have to give me a number, but does anybody think they could, they could come up with an answer? <laughs> you guys are too well trained. <laughs> This will not be on the test. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the popular perception is that Korea has just been constantly invaded. We're the small country. The big countries do whatever they want. Uh, and I'm going to give you a different story, actually, and one that, one that shows a lot more stability in East Asia, which for those of you who do uh, world history or, or whatever else, is actually, I think, one of the most interesting things about East Asian history is how it actually worked, right? Because if we go to Europe, and we all know this, right? The history of Europe is a blood-soaked series of unending wars against each other. From the Hundred Years' War, the Seven Years' War, the, uh, you know, just on and on and on, right? Uh, Napoleon, Trafalgar, etc. In Europe, you had a bunch of similarly sized states, kingdoms, whatever, that spent centuries beating the uh, stuffing out of each other. 
Uh, and the best way to show this is if you put a map. So this is, this is Europe in 1300, and we have a whole bunch of political units here that don't exist anymore, right? So there's a King Crown of Castile or Genoa and Savoy, Duchy of Guienne, whatever, right? Uh, a whole bunch of political units. And in fact, the, the Europe that we know today really didn't even begin to come into focus until the 19th century. So Europe by 1800 is beginning to look like Spain and Portugal, but you still have Sardinia, you still have Naples, the Kingdom of Naples, Torino, Helvetic Republic, the Ottoman Empire. So borders in Europe changed constantly as kingdoms rose and fell and people conquered each other and moved back and forth. The Europe that we know today is actually really recent. Now, in contrast, in, in, in East Asia, the four main states of East Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and China, have basically existed for well over a thousand years. Their borders changed a little bit, but these are identifiably the same units. And so Korea became Korea around the seventh century. Now, there's a lot of historical uh, 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 debate over this, this kingdom called Goguryeo. But essentially, there were three kingdoms on the Korean peninsula. Before then, the uh, Baekje, Shilla, and Goguryeo, this Kaya was a, was a smaller thing. Uh, before then, around 200 AD, there were a bunch of little tribes, things back and forth. These kingdoms developed around 200, so that by 600 AD, you had basically three large kingdoms. Yamato, Japan, the Japanese state that we know today, it roughly traces its emergence to around the 6th or 7th century. Before then, again, just a bunch of little tribes or something. And, but there we can trace a political heritage. Now, the interesting thing is that here, there was a world war. There was a world war, meaning everybody who could be involved was involved. Uh, oops, right? So the Japanese allied with Baekje. Shilla allied with Tang, China. Uh, Shilla and Tang crushed Goguryeo. Uh, they then beat up Baekje, and the Japanese sent some troops. They sent them home. So there's a massive war, a couple decades. And when the dust settled, you basically had the, the beginnings of a unified Korean political unit, which covered two-thirds of the peninsula, around 700 AD. And that political unit basically sort of pushed northwards, so that by the 10th century, the border with China was this thing called the Yalu River. By the Choson dynasty of, 13, of 1400, they had basically filled out to what it looks like today. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Because this region up here, as you may or may not know, the Manchurian region is basically wilderness. It's really cold. It's desolate. It's big mountains. It's, nobody really lives there. So the border that did get demarcated by 1000 AD was the Yalu River. This was the most important border because this is where people from Korea went over to China to trade, and they went back and forth. Up here is just a bunch of wilderness. Now, why, why is this interesting? Literally 1,000 years, this river has been the border between China and Korea. That's an astonishing amount of stability between two recognizably political units that exist today. The same thing actually in Vietnam. Vietnam and China, proto-Viet, Annam at the time, demarcated a border with China at Lansong. In 1999, when they did the formal modern treaty with the border, it's this exact same place that it had been since basically the 10th century. That's an astonishing amount of stability between political units. These are deeply, deeply uh, long-lived kingdoms with a sense of who they are and a sense of difference from, from someone else. All right, whoops. So, so how is this actually different from East Asia? In some ways, this is, this is what we call the tribute system, right? There was a set of ideas out there that are very different from modern sense of how you do international relations. I mean, the best example of it is uh, that woven through our ideas of international relations, and domestic politics is the idea of equality, right? This is a this is a Enlightenment notion, French Enlightenment notion from the 17th century. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What's that from? 
<laughs> no, right? Um, it's also from, of course, the way that we think about international relations. Once you are a nation state and you're granted diplomatic recognition and you send ambassadors, everybody's the same. So the United States is formally the same as a tiny country like Bolivia. And that's not to criticize Bolivia, but Bolivia is two million people. On nothing are they the same in terms of size, power, wealth, anything. Two million people, 300 million people, right? We've got nuclear weapons, they don't. They're not the same at all, except we're called nation states. So this idea of equality is deeply woven through international relations and in terms of our domestic politics. But as, as uh, I heard briefly mentioned before, East Asia has a very different historical sense of international relations and what we would call as hierarchic, not equality, which sort of intuitively it wouldn't be. Why, why would you think that they're the same? They're not the same, <laughs> but rather a rank order. And the interesting thing is that in Europe, you had an idea of equality, formal equality, informal inequality, because of course there were some countries were bigger, more powerful than others, and endless fighting. And in East Asia, you had formal hierarchy, formal ranking of countries. Informally, the big countries, China, left everybody alone. They didn't really interfere in South Korean or Korean domestic politics at all. So informal equality uh, and centuries of stability. And there were sort of two basic norms or practices. Uh, one is called investiture. Uh, and then the other was just cultural learning. And investiture was basically going through the motions of going to the Chinese emperor and saying, do you approve of me being king? So you send some, tr so you send some diplomats to China. The emperor says, of course you can be king. Here's a bunch of gifts. You go home. And the Chinese emperor leaves you alone. Right? Formally, you're saying, yeah, you're, you're an emperor. I'm only a king. But informally, the Chinese didn't care. They just wanted to make sure you understood where the rank order was. Because... That all ended in the 20th century. These centuries of stability disappeared with the arrival of the West. The arrival of the West, uh, the beginning of sort of semi-imperialism, colonization of China, and the colonization of everybody else changed all of East Asia. You see that in the 20th century in, in Korea and East Asia, extraordinary tumult. Just astonishing amount of change. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple. Japanese imperialism, national division, war, democracy. Here's Korea in 1905. This is the uh, king's palace. Well, this was Korea, right? And a bunch of indigenous Koreans running around, right? This, this looks like Korea. Well, in 1905, and then formally in 1910, uh, Japan colonized Korea. They formally took it over and annexed it so that Korea no longer existed. Now, you're going to hear a lot about this, I think, both in, in these classes or if you read about Korea. So I'm not going to say a whole lot here, other than to say from 1910 to 1945 is, is a period that m many Koreans remember or learn about as being extraordinarily harsh. The Japanese came in. There was repression. Over time, they were forced to learn Japanese and were, were forced to not use their own Korean names. You had to choose a Japanese name. Uh, my father was born at that time, so he's fluent in Japanese. Right? And they all took, when they took Japanese names, he said they all tried to use ones that were sort of similar to the Korean name. Right? So a lot of internal resistance. But it was a very, very difficult time. And obviously for Koreans, who had been a strong, proud country, proud of their accomplishments, for literally unified since the 6th century AD, is extraordinarily humiliating. And the best example I can give that to you, this is the, the, the king's palace. And what the Japanese did in the center of that palace is build their administrative building right over the top. So here's that same picture. This is the only one I could find. Had I known better, I would have taken pictures when I was there, right? So here is that same Kwanghwamun. And here is the Japanese Imperial Administration building. There can't be a more uh, insulting thing that you do than to put down your building right in front. Even more than that, if you look at it from the top, and I wasn't able to find a picture of this. If you looked at that building from the top, it was written in the Japanese character of uh, sun for Japan. So the building is built as sort of like a, uh, uh, the Japanese character for, for Japan. 
extraordinarily humiliating you can imagine, right? If there was, and again, the example, of course, if in DC in front of the Washington Monument, the Soviets build a big uh, onion dome thing, right? It'd be now, the reason that uh, many of you can't see it today is finally, uh, a couple of years ago, they decided to tear down this building. Uh, and they're, they're re restoring the, the, the palace to what it looked like before. Well, after that, you get independence in 1945, but immediate division of the peninsula into north and south. Right? It was decided in around 1943 by the US and the Soviet Union at the, uh, uh, I think, Malta conference. Stalin and, and Roosevelt are sitting around with um, uh, Churchill, and they say, what are we going to do? Let's divide up Germany to, to make sure that Germany doesn't fight again. Let's divide up the Korean Peninsula. You take the northern half, Soviets. I'll take the southern half. We'll, we'll um, uh, demobilize the Japanese troops. Now, the interesting thing about this is, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about this, is this has never all made, made that much sense to me. I mean, I, do, I understand why. The Americans did not want to let the Soviets have the entire peninsula because it's geopolitically important. Why the Soviets agreed to, the, to a division is sort of surprising. But even beyond that, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. We divided up Germany because they started a war. So why didn't we divide up Japan? <laughs> right? Why did we divide up Korea and not Japan? The Japanese and Russians had even fought a war in 1904 over the islands. They still dispute to this day the Northern Territories. Why didn't you divide sort of Soviets get Tokyo and the Americans get Kyoto or something like that, right? The world would be totally different. Actually, probably all of the Korean Peninsula would be communist, but you know, it's interesting to think. Why, did you, why do we not divide up Japan? What would the world look like if we had not divided up Korea? And it was totally imposed from the outside. That being said, it was divided. That being the beginning said, it was Cold divided. The beginning of the Cold War. Uh, the war the Korean War destroyed about 75% of all productive capacity on Korean Peninsula. As you know, the North Koreans invaded, all went all the way down to a tiny foothold at Pusan. Then the Americans outflanked them. We went all the way up to the Yalu River. Then the Chinese intervened, and we went all the way back down again. And eventually, the war stabilized exactly where it started, in the 38th parallel. There was nothing left to bomb. And this is Seoul, which changed hands three times. Now, in some ways, horrific tragedy. Everybody who's Korean has a memory of the Korean War, lost a friend, lost a, a, a brother, or their family is divided. Somebody's in the North, somebody's in the South. About 2 million Koreans died, 10% of the population at the time. Right? There's a lot of tragedies in the world, right? So I'm not going to say this is bigger or worse than <laughs> Soviets losing 20 million in, in World War II, but it is a horrific tragedy to Koreans. The tragedy today is, and I'll talk about this when I talk about North Korea. We are exactly in the same place we were in, as we were in 1953. There has been almost zero change in North-South -South relations, US, whatever, right? We have still a divided peninsula, Cold War, et cetera, et cetera, except North Korea now has a couple nukes. It's the only difference. Right? Nothing has changed basically in 60 years. Seoul, on the other hand, have a horrible, horrific war that wipes out 10% of your population because then you'll get to rebuild. But in fact, you did get a chance to rebuild. And what South Korea was able to do, this is the Han River, this is Seoul. And after the Korean War, basically everybody got to start over in 1950. So not just with infrastructure. Here's the, here's the uh, Kwangpum with the gate again. Here's 1980. You can see there's the, uh, uh, the, the mountains around Seoul, some buildings. And here we are today, right? You can't even see. Somewhere over there is, uh, you know, downtown, right? Un unrecognizable from what it was like in 1950 or 1900. So this is, this is the benefit. Like, I, again, I'm not going to suggest countries do this. But they got a chance to start over. And it wasn't just physical. Social classes got screwed up. Everything was up for grabs. So there was no ruling class, peasants, etc. I mean, there were. But with a war and colonization and division, Basically, everybody got a chance to start over. So enormous transition, right? Now, during the Cold War, there were a whole bunch of military governments, coups d'etat. Uh, and in fact, no leader between 1948 and 1987. So for almost 40 years, no South Korean leader had voluntarily left office. They had all either been kicked out, assassinated, or, uh, uh, or you know, exiled. 
military law. There was one dictator who ruled, uh, you know, then he got killed by his own CIA guy, and another one took over in 1979, killed about 2,000 citizens, between 500 and 2,000 of his own citizens to keep power. Right? We remember Tiananmen. We don't remember uh, 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 Guangzhou because Tiananmen's bad Chinese and Guangzhou was our ally, so we sort of ignored it. These were brutal, repressive governments. By 1980s, though, by the 1980s, uh, here's the Kwangju protest, people taking over, right? By the 1980s, there had been enough economic development, and the, sort of the world is changing in different ways, that South Koreans and millions began to enter the streets. And we had a, a, a very dramatic democratic transition in 1987, when the president at the time decided not to call out the troops, and he left office voluntarily. And since then, for the next, last 24 years, we've had um, uh, here, here democracy demonstrations in 1987. And here's one thing about Koreans, which I, which I will point out, right? Uh, this is the other side. This is not a sort of we're, you know, you're the king, we're the peasants, you can do whatever you want. When Koreans aren't happy with something, they let you know. <laughs> which, is, which is really interesting, right? There is a deeply, I'm not going to call it democratic, but egalitarian strand in Korean society, which says, I'm as good as anybody, and it's my right to tell you what to do. And they didn't like what the government was doing, and uh, now we have democracy today. <laughs> Stable, <laughs> placid. <laughs> it is interesting, right? I mean, uh, it's, still, it's still evolving, and, and, and it, is fun, it is fun to do this because they, they literally s spray each other with fire hoses and, and beat each other up and stuff. At the same time, it's a young democracy, and we, we had, we had um, in the United States, 200 years ago, we had, um, what do you call it, duels, right? We, it took us a long time to get to where we are today, where even though we hate it, actually, I'm not sure, I think we're going backwards right now. But <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was going to say, even though you may hate the other guy, you're like my respected senator from Nebraska or whatever, right? I mean, think we're, but it is a democracy. There have been peaceful transfers of power despite this. There's no worry that the military is going to come out. I mean, Korea has a lot of things to be proud of. The economic development, this transition to <laughs> democracy. I should put another picture on, but like people vote, right? There is a, a movement towards better freedom of press, freedom of speech, things like that, right? If you, and again, if you go to Korea in 1910 or 1950, you would not bet on this country having done this. There's no way, if you looked at Korea in 1950, you'd say, that's a country that's going to be an economic miracle that everybody's going to know about around the world and is going to be a stable democracy, right? So in many ways, this is really interesting how Korea has gone. The 20th century was extraordinarily tumultuous for Korea. Colonization, division, war, military coups d'etat, up until the 19, late 1980s, millions of people in the street protesting for democracy. So that, that, that transition, though, Korea has managed the transition to modernity quite well, given the kinds of uh, uh, things it had on its plate, so to speak. Now, let me just conclude very briefly, and then we can talk about whatever you want, right? So, so why is Korea interesting? I think there's a number of reasons beyond the fact that I happen to be Korean American and I care. First of all, North Korea remains a major international security problem for the entire region and for the United States. If North Korea was gone, the whole region would look different if that was not a problem. Obviously, the economic success and democracy in South Korea. Two, three, four million Korean Americans in America. And they're going to be here. Right? Uh, and Koreans are very proud, passionate people. Not emotional, just passionate. Um, so, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, roughly now, let me talk about North Korea. And I'm only gonna, I'll make two points. I really only have one point, and then, and then we have plenty of time to talk about whatever you want. And my, my one point is basically this, and I wonder, do I have it up here? No, I don't, okay. Um, my point is this, right? 22, 24 million, hu million human beings. It's true, I did get quoted occasionally uh, a couple weeks ago. The thing that I found most disturbing about the death of Kim Jong-il, uh, about the way that we in America responded to it, is this roar, a roar of 
every person who had like ever eaten Korean food was like an authority giving, you know, giving an interview or blogging or something like that, right? Or had been to Seoul, had been to the airport. It was astonishing how many people were like instant experts on North Korea. Not only that, if they, if they had something good to say, it would be true. But the way that we view North Koreans, everybody was doing this. There was the few voices of reason totally drowned out by the morons who were talking about, they're brainwashed, they're robots, they're idiots, they're crazy, right? And we tend to forget the one thing I want you to take away, if you take away anything from today's talk, it would be actually this, which is there are 22 million human beings up there, and they think they're normal. They don't think they're weird and crazy and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit, because it is very easy for us to just do this. <laughs> Now, granted, The Economist is very funny. I give them credit. I love this, you know. This is, who's this? Kim Jong-il. He just died. And by the way, he, had, he was inconsiderate in death as in life. He died right before Christmas. Like, come on. <laughs> he ruined my Christmas. Um, right? But yeah, it's easy to, to laugh at this guy. He's sort of pudgy. He looks weird, right? This was taken at, at, in 2000, the first time that the South and North Korean leaders had ever met. They got together, they had a summit meeting. And to their credit, the reason they're saying this is because people were surprised that he could actually speak normally, you know, that he wasn't foaming at the mouth and stuff like that, right? And he was. He could speak very, very smoothly. And in fact, he showed a lot of respect to the South Korean leader who was older than him. South Korea is very hierarchic, a very Confucian thing. The, the South Korean leader is 20 years older than him. He used the right types of words that you would use to someone who is 20 years older than you. Right? He wasn't trying to speak as an equal or anything else, right? So anyway, yeah, greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> Take me to your leader. Um, but this is the way that we tend to think about North Korea, right? But in many ways, North Korea is more Korean than South Koreans. I mean, South Koreans, in doing all the cool stuff they've done, globalization, economic development, democracy, right? You go to Seoul today, it's a global city. People's values have changed. They're sort of Korean, you know, but they're, they're global people now, right? North Korea, in some ways, is stuck in a time warp. It's the same way they've been doing things for 100 years. Most of these pictures are taken by uh, Russian tourists, um, although, again, we have a lot more access to North Korea now than we ever had before. So they're still using, you know, uh, cows and stuff like this. This is my favorite picture, and I almost fell over when I saw that picture a couple years ago, because this... Does anybody know what this is, basically? Yeah, ice skates, right? When you don't have uh, ice skates, you take a block of wood and two sticks. The rivers freeze over. It's way north up there, right? Now, the amazing thing, my father was born in the 1930s. Uh, he also was born in northern Korea. He, they came south as refugees uh, right before the war. And when I saw that, the reason I almost fell over is my father, when I was growing up, he would tell me stories about him growing up, and he said, Back in the 30s, we used to take a block of wood and two sticks, right? And he actually even drew me a picture of it. And when I saw this, I was like, nothing has changed. Literally nothing has changed. And I actually found the picture that he drew. I went home and looked at it, right? So this is them, right? This is the rice paddies. Actually, I, I, I found it. It was in a box at home last year, and I found it, right? One interesting thing, North Koreans were the first to adopt Christianity. They were the ones, it was much more receptive in the northern part of Korea than the south in the early 20th century. Interestingly enough, Billy Graham and now his son have been regularly preaching in North Korea since the 1980s. Because Kim Il-sung's father, a mother, was one of the first people to become Christian in, again, 1910s or something like that. So he always had a pretty warm spot in his heart for the American missionaries who, had, who, who we had grown up with. Right? Obviously, it's not freedom of religion right now. But, you know, and the point, the point that I make is that they think they're normal. And what I mean by that is it's very easy for us to exoticize them, to, to put a bunch of caricatures on them, right? They all walk around, they're all brainwashed, they're all walking around like automatons, right? But you look at these little kids, gyopda, they're very cute, right? Um, this is where they're growing up. This is their home. This is their family. This is where they went to school. Right? They're like anybody else, where they have to get along, they have to live, they have to survive, but you know, they wake up in the morning, they worry about their baby, they go to work, fight with your wife. <laughs> she doesn't look that happy, right? But, uh, 
but we forget that they're actually human beings. Are things changing? A little bit. Here we have a cocoa crepinated drink. Yongjin, <laughs> right? I mean, there are things that are changing, some more slowly than others. But to view North Korea as an unchanging, everybody thinks the same way, is an enormous mistake. And it only makes it harder for us to have appropriate policies towards North Korea. Now, who is this? You guys all know this, right? This is the, this is the third son, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Pardon? Well, this is the thing. So the joke was, the joke, because we had no pictures. To this day, we don't know how old he is. We know he's below 30 years old, right? That's how little we know about him. And up, up until last year, we had no photos of him at all. So he was anointed last year, and he started to show up. He's 28, 29 years old. So the joke that went around, sort of a grim joke, but the joke that went around after we finally saw pictures of him is, uh, now we know where all the food aid went. <laughs> <laughs> because he is. He clearly is not hungry. Um, right? So, you know, uh, I'll conclude my, 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 my point about North Korea just by saying that it is easy to forget that there's people up there because they don't want you to think there's people up there, first of all. And nothing has changed. We are basically in exactly the same position we were in 1953. We are in what I call a new Cold War. And we're in the same place. And it's not clear. I mean, something may change with this new guy. But it's not at all clear. I mean, they, people like to, the favorite part of the game is will they survive, will they not, will they collapse? You know? They've survived far longer than anyone else expected. They could collapse tomorrow. But my feeling is if they didn't collapse in the mid-1990s with a horrific famine that killed maybe a million people uh, with intense US pressure, they're better off than they were 15 years ago in that sense. So I, I don't think anything uh, will change for anytime soon. But you never know. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about them. Let me just conclude very briefly, and then we can talk about whatever.